the accidents. We had a family tradition to go to Temple Square in downtown Salt Lake City, and as children attempt to enjoy the lights and freezing cold temperatures, as we walked around and looked at the decorations this Mormon religion spends thousands of tax-free dollars on every year to decorate every square inch of their holy grounds with pagan idols and idolatry. We would go to the square, then walk down Main Street and look at the ZCMI shopping center mall windows. Every year, they would take down the mannequins and merchandise displays they had up and offer the space to local artists that wanted to create a winter wonderland scene. The only requirement was that it was built with 100% edible items. They were amazing, to say the least. I remember wondering how someone could come up with the idea and plan, then use only food to make these sometimes lifelike sculptures that were then thrown away as waste. It was amazing and aggravating at the same time as a child. This building had changed so many times over the decades, and my growing disgust to be around things of this world have kept me from returning to this area to see what it's like now. I'm sure it's gross, like every other major city in this forsaken country. After freezing half to death in the winter of weather of Utah, we would pack back into the station wagon and hand it, head to a nearby restaurant for a meal. Usually it was D's on West Temple, but sometimes my dad would splurge and we'd go to Chuckarama. This is a local homestyle cooking buffet. All you can eat. It had things we didn't normally get at home. Magical foods that tickled the taste buds. And we ate as much as we possibly could. My parents never left that place feeling like they owed it, or they didn't get their money's worth. All the way around. Especially as I was growing and eating more and more. There were delicacies to my palate, like creamy macaroni and cheese, fluffy, buttery, soft, oven-fresh rolls, every color of jello you wanted, including the famous Utah green jello with carrot shreds and raisins. They had a chicken, roasted, fried, stripped, boiled, baked, rotisserie, you name it. There were always at least three kinds of ice cream in the machines, usually just chocolate, vanilla, and the classic twist. Really only two, I know, but as a kid, that's three. Then there was the ice cream fixings. Crushed Oreos, gummy bears, chocolate and butterscotch chips and syrup, strawberry syrup, chocolate syrup, marshmallows. Let your imagination roll because it was there. It was heaven as a growing boy. After stuffing our faces, we would pack up in the wagon and head home on the hour and a half long drive back from the city. My parents were devout Mormons, so we always ended our holiday trip with an Xmas-based Book of Mormon study. The first car accident I remember happening when I was eight or nine. We were in Salt Lake, driving past the Cathedral of the Madeline in the Avenues area. The traffic light on the two-way, two-lane road was waiting to turn left. My dad didn't notice one of the cars wasn't moving, but the car didn't have brake lights lighting up either. The car was a manual transmission, and the driver had been just feathering the clutch because of the weather and traffic congestion. By the time Dad realized, at 30 to 40 miles an hour, on snow-covered roads, it was too late. Our car didn't have enough traction for the locked wheels to grab. We slid into them at the speed we were going. Yells fill the car. This is about the point where time slowed down. Smash. Mom flies forward from the impact. Crunch. My mind recognizes the sound of metal on metal. Shatter. Mom's forehead hits the windshield, and I see her bounce off and settle back in her seat and reach up and grab her head with her right hand. Screaming. My younger brother and sister and my older sister start wailing and crying. My mom is yelling in pain, and Dad is trying to ask if everyone is all right. Buzzing. My hearing goes fuzzy. Everything is muffled as I hear myself scream as well. Mommy! I was sitting in the rear-facing seat, my older sister in the middle row, behind Dad who was driving. The car seat, holding my younger brother, was in the middle of that row, and my youngest sister was behind Mom. Mom never wore her seat belt. She wasn't really ever a small woman either. She hit the windshield hard. The glass spider webbed out from the impact point hard enough in enough directions. I remember it making me nauseous, trying to see out the window until Dad replaced it. There was blood on the glass, and after she hit the glass, she bounced back and settled into the seat, holding her head. This was about the point I yelled, Mommy. Now I know this is going to sound terrible. <sighs> but I think it was just the way to my juvenile mind at the time. I don't know if her response was justified with the chaos that was ensuing, but it hurt. She screamed back, Shut up and turn around! Ouch. Looking back with the shock, panic, screaming children, and trauma of what had just taken place, it was pure reaction. But to a child in a time of trauma, that was a message received loud and clear. 
I don't understand what happened that day, but I now realize that's when the wall of caring for how my mother felt went up. From that day forward, I was programmed not to be concerned with her well-being. Like I said, there's a lot of PTSD I'm working on through. Weird stuff, too. So let's bounce around a little here. Car accidents. I've had my share. That was the first I remember. Until I was about 16, I wasn't involved in any other besides the one as a kid. But I was always hyper aware of them and unhealthily interested when we would pass by one. I hung out with the wrong kids in my teen, later teen years. I'd go to parties with them. I started smoking weed because of their influence. I started smoking cigarettes when I was about 14, and I wasn't able to quit successfully until I was 35. I found I could understand the lessons in school better when I was stoned, so I smoked weed. A lot. I've since learned that cannabis allows me to close those extra tabs that my mind gets squirrely on so I can effectively focus on the task at hand. But I would run around with the bad kids and help them steal car stereos and anything else in the vehicle of value. I would stay out past curfew and didn't care if I got caught. It got to the point that Dad even looked into sending me to a Mormon-based rehabilitation camp for youth called Camp Leahona. But one weekend, my buddy and I drove two hours to go to a party in a whiteout blizzard. We were smart. We arrived safe enough and really enjoyed the night. The next morning, as we were on our way back down the mountain, neighborhood roads, we slid off and rolled his Toyota pickup. If it wasn't for the branch that came through the window and hugged up on us, hugged us up on the tree it was growing from and had not caught us, I wouldn't be writing this. Another accident I was involved in was when I was 24 or 25. I was working for an exploratory drilling company from Salt Lake, and the job that I was assigned on was in Alaska. We were headed to Fairbanks, back from a man camp for the mine we worked at. Four guys in a 2004 Ford F-350, four-door crew cab. The eight-foot bed had a toolbox, a 49-gallon diesel fuel tank, a headache rack, and was loaded down with all our gear from drilling in Alaska through the spring, summer, and fall seasons. The road out of the mine to the pavement was gravel, and it was in better shape than the pavement that day. It was about 18 degrees, snowing, and the roads were spotted with black ice. We were only able to travel about 20 to 35 miles an hour, safely. Fairbanks was normally a three and a half hour drive from the mine, and the weather being what it was, I settled in for a long, long, relaxing trip in the back seat. I was coming off a 20-day hitch where we worked for 12 hours a day on a little drill rig in the middle of the Alaskan tundra. We would be flown via helicopter from the man camp to the drill rig that was 8 to 10 air miles from camp, rotating day and night shifts, no days off for 20 days straight, in a dry camp, no alcohol, 4 hours from civilization. Numerous times we were stuck at the rig because the weather would not allow the pilot to fly safely to come get us for shift change. I have a love-hate relationship with Alaska because of this job. About an hour into the drive, we hit the pavement off the dirt access road to the mine. Creeping along with what traffic we would encounter, we had 12 hours to get to the airport before our flight's home left. We weren't in a hurry. The guy driving, we called him Hoss. He was a massive man, six foot nine and pushing 400 pounds. Describing him as solid was an understatement. Being heavy-footed was kind of in his nature. Well, we hit a patch of black ice, he got spooked and slammed the brakes. The fleet truck we were in was not as well-maintained as the company liked to claim it was. The anti-locking brake system didn't work. We slid, fishtailed, and started spinning on the ice-covered road. Like I said, I settled in for a long ride, so I wasn't paying attention to the driving like I normally did. This is where time slowed. 